What is Krakalakin, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Pavali, joined by my certified fantabulous co-host, Mr. Grant Hughes, and also joined by the equally certifiably fantabulous, that is a mouthful, Keith Parrish, the host of the Fast Break Breakfast podcast, a Hardwood Knox favorite. He also hosts the Grits and Grinds podcast, a Grizzlies podcast follow him on twitter at fast break break that's at fs f-a-s-t excuse me b-r-e-k b-r-e-k and then follow the grits and grinds podcast at grizzlies pod spelled exactly as it sounds the link to both of those podcasts will be in our youtube and own podcast description so go subscribe keith welcome back thank you for coming back everyone knows we're going to be talking to you about the grizzlies at this point but first we have to ask how the heck are mm. you doing uh, I'm doing great. I appreciate being described as a mouthful. It's one of my fav- <laughs> favorite personal adjectives. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, Grant, how are we care about how you're doing too? How are you doing? No, no, nobody cares. We have Keith Parrish and we have Keith Parrish's cat of secondary importance, which That's I hope right. my appearance. cat is, is right now nipping under the heel of me just running under this table. It's a continual like uh, it's a challenge. It's become an obstacle. It's a new cat. Um, we've had her for a couple of weeks, and she is very excited and things she loves. She loves podcasting. She loves microphones. She loves uh, little ring lights. She loves wires. She like it is nonstop. Um, as if podcasting isn't enough of a challenge on its own. Now I have like I've raised the difficulty level, and it's a it's a fun challenge. Imagine the disappointment of this cat had had it been brought to a house that did not have all these things, uh, you know. To, <laughs> I that, feel that like this so cat much. is adaptable enough where it would have found its own passion wherever okay. it ended up. So, Great cat. Yeah, good cat. How old is this cat? Uh, indeterminate. Let's say five months. We sure. It was a foster situation where a friend of ours was fostering it, and then we took it in. And so it's it's... I'm no animal expert. I believe they told us it's, it's maybe five or six months old. Um, it's pretty tiny. It's very adorable. It's very loving. It just gets uh, filled with a rage induced jealousy whenever she is not the center of intention of attention and thus lashes out with the, Hey, w- what happens if I chew on that wire as hard as I can? And, I get the same yeah. way when Grant talks about his children and not me enough. Uh, I yeah. was going to say so all the things you're describing sound like children to me. The, yeah. you know, like, no, no, no. See, here's the thing, Grant. Do you have children? Wires, but... Grant, Grant, do you have children? I do. Okay. So I don't know if you've tried this. If I ignore my children, uh-huh. they get the hint. <laughs> and they eventually, after, I don't know, it might take you years for me. It only took a few months. Uh, They're I'm like, oh. Try. Uh, this guy's not going to play with us. We'll go do our own thing. Okay. So you can you can maybe give that a go. I don't yeah. think that's going to work on this cat. I, I do a lot of scowling that which is yeah. still attention. So I should probably. Yeah. No. No. That. No. That's exactly what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Man, they're they're just wrong. looking for a reaction. The worst thing slash best thing you can do give them nothing, no response, <laughs> and then they What's tire of it, wrong? and then they uh, they go do something else. <laughs> I'm going to I'm denoting all of this for tips if I ever have children. Well, it, it's similar to when you're on social media and you say you see a particularly egregious post. The best thing you can do is nothing. That's right. I understand. Like that. everyone's like, oh, guys, the athletic uh, posted that the Anthony Edwards is too big of a fish for the pond of Minnesota. What's wrong with journalism? Look at this. And it's just like, good job. That was their most interacted with tweet of the past 12 months. Like you taught them by, uh, by (laughs) quote, tweeting, dunking on this thing. Like, no, we're, we're in a rage based click economy. And it's like, it was like, guys, I don't know what the numbers were, but I'm guessing like, Hey, 80 million people saw this tweet or something. So like same with maybe a few, I I joke with the kids. Don't ignore your children, but the best thing you can do sometimes (laughs) <laughs> just give no reaction and then they move on. Like I tell my, I tell my oldest when his young, when the younger sister's picking on him, I'm like, if you don't react, she will stop doing it. They're just, you're just going for the reaction. If we all as a society stopped <laughs> retweeting the terrible tweets, they would go away because there'd be no point. But of course, uh, society is lost. What do you want to talk about now? Um, do we need uh, to talk and- about the Grizzlies or can we just continue really solving all the problems right well, now? Well, like if you if you listen to my show Fast Break Breakfast, yes, we talk about the NBA. 
And that's, I think, the majority of what we talk about. But we also, we just talk about the world. We solve the world's problems. We, we <laughs> point out the things that are obviously wrong. And we, we provide no helpful solutions to correct them. Um, and speaking of rage bait, now give mm -hmm. us your 10 best John Morant trades. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying, if we could get, all right, I'm just saying, if we could get these five guys, I would, no. Um, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> yeah. I wanted to start with, I was actually going to start with the Marcus Smart trade, but I know you mm -hmm. had some pretty strong thoughts about the John Morant suspension um, being docked 25 games for, I believe it was contract detrimental to the league. I know you've talked about it after it came out. You also kind of talked about it when there's been other things that have happened with other players and any like, I can't remember it was the Spurs, was it Devontae Graham got a, a Dewey or something was suspended two games. Yep. yep. Where do you just land on what the disciplinary action was here for, for John Morant? I mean, I, I I don't know if I had a strong reaction to the John Morant suspension because it was my strongest reaction was like, I thought John Morant's behavior was just like indefensible and like a, it fell on, it fell into the, what in the world are you doing category? Like I, you know, so I, like the, when we talk suspensions, it's always awkward, I guess, to kind of like just, try to adjudicate like what behavior deserves what suspensions. And of course, when it comes to sports leagues, there are, some of it is covered by the collective bargaining agreement. Some of it, there's like this weird leeway where Adam silver can determine conduct detrimental to the league. And so I think my, my initial reaction, the, the nightclub gun video in Colorado last year, you're like, all right, this is a problem. And then there's just this, like, there's this groundswell of other events. And there were, there was the interaction with, John Morant and his friends and his associates with the Pacers team bus. There was allegations of like a laser pointer. Like nothing was ever proved. There were these other things that were on TMZ, the Washington Post, about like these fights after basketball games or whatever. Like it was all this different stuff. And so that like had been growing for a while. And then when you had the Colorado video, like there were a lot of concerning elements to that. Like, yes, you have a gun in a nightclub, which you shouldn't have that. Like, how did the gun get there? Then it became the whole, was it on the team plane? And that's a whole new thing because of, you know, previous NBA history of like the Gilbert Arenas problem and the Javars Crinton. So like all that to say, just to retread where we were like the eight game suspension back then you're like, okay, fine. But also it was those, it's like, what, what else are you going to do? Because like there has to be normally these precedents for what a suspension can be. And as much as I think everyone agreed, like no one was defending John Morant's right. I mean, maybe some people were, but like I wasn't defending John Morant's right to have um, just a random gun uh, at, at a drinking establishment like th that felt that felt to me if I'm on my moral high horse I'm like that feels wrong but like there's laws and he wasn't charged with anything so anyways when Adam Silver did the whole all right you're suspended for eight games and he missed a couple more and like the Grizzlies you know had him go away and then there was like the weird PR spin and I don't know how much of that was literally PR there was the awkward ESPN interview where I I'm more of a cynic just with everything and I'm like mm -hmm. this is this does not feel like an honest interaction between two people. And so there was last year's thing. And you're like, all right, whatever, eight games, that's that's fine, or 10 games. And like, am I skeptical of the steps taken? I am, but that's who I am as a person. But I'm obviously, I think with most people who aren't monsters, we're just wishing for the best. We want John Murray to take care of himself. Um, you know, if he's really dealing with all the things he says he is, by all means, we hope he can find helpful ways to deal with the stress of being a professional athlete of being this like high profile star. And then we want him to stop handling guns on social media. Cause that's just irresponsible period. Like, um, I am, uh, so anyway, we'll fast forward to the new thing and my take on the 25 game suspension for him flashing another gun on mm -hmm. Instagram. My opinion was, I consider that it's indefensible that he would do that. But also, it feels like this punishment is based on the fact that he seemingly like offended Adam Silver, or like he told he told the league, "I got it, I got it, no more guns on Instagram, I got it." All right, just say no more. And this, then he does it again, and they're like, "What in the world?" And like, I understood him getting suspended, and I thought you have to increase the suspension. I thought it would be like ten games or, or whatever. When it came out with twenty five, like I wasn't shocked or surprised, but like. I guess what you may be referring to, Dan, my, my strong take was this is going to feel weird whenever someone does something that's like actually illegal or mm -hmm. wrong. And so this is where it goes to like, how do you compare 
different behavior. You mentioned Devonte Graham, like, um, uh, on the day before we're recording this, uh, Kevin Porter Jr. gets arrested yeah. for what sounds like, I mean, I guess I, I don't want to, I guess rank domestic violence, but some particularly heinous domestic violence. And it's yeah. like, there's no, there's no history when you go going back to gun stuff. There's no big history of the NBA suspending guys for these massive amounts of games, like the the, the Gilbert Arenas suspension, whatever it was. If it's like a half a season, mm. he had a gun in the locker room and pulled it on somebody. Like they pointed guns at each other, like that that. And it's like the difference between that and like holding a legal gun. Now we get into the semantics, and it's just not fun to talk about. Of like, because again, like we, you, me, we, we just want to talk about basketball, yeah. and like my uh, my views on guns are probably radical compared to maybe normal people and especially compared to like guns rights advocates i'm just like just get rid of guns like what in the world yeah. um but uh so like what ja did i thought a 25 game suspension is like that feels extreme to me but of course he he didn't appeal the grizzlies seemed all on board with it i mean trying to read between the lines of like the way they dealt with a lot of the stuff that happened around John Morant. It felt like the organization was frustrated and I don't have any personal knowledge if anyone in the organization was actually frustrated, but it's like, they, they were like when that Instagram, the second Instagram video dropped, they were like, yeah, he's suspended. It was just like, it was within hours. Like they didn't wait for the league to do anything. Um, and so like they, and then when the 25 games was announced, they're like, yeah, works for us. Like They, they put out a, a team statement basically saying that works for us. So I think my strong opinion was like, I feel like when we do the really uncomfortable thing of comparing various crimes and non-crimes, like all right, waving a gun irresponsibly or handling a gun irresponsibly, even though it's legal to have guns in cars in most states in the South, uh, like it's like like he didn't break a law, and then when you compare it to actual law breaking, it becomes like, well, what are we gonna do now if we set this this precedent of like twenty five games for this? And again, maybe this right on what I'm talking about when it comes to like uh legal matters that that is covered in the cba doing things that the commissioner finds unsavory there's there's more leeway and especially than the gun issue there's even more leeway um seemingly yeah that i, I just you're making me rehash all of the stuff that i thought i think were very much aligned with that it did feel like it's I and I had to tread very carefully much like when you're trying to parse the significance of uh domestic violence or or various rule breakings of legal and non-legal issues with the nba i talked about it in like a parenting context and it seemed like adam silver is the parent here and he sort of the first time through said is everyone clear on the expectations now do we all agree <laughs> yeah. that you cannot yeah. do this thing it doesn't even matter what the thing is we get it yes yes absolutely got it won't do that and then the the thing happens again and it's just like, well, now what? We have to escalate. And that I totally agree. I think you're dead on that. It felt yeah. like it was just a defiance of a clearly laid out expectation. It almost doesn't. I mean, it, guns in the NBA have something of a history and there are serious punishments for that sort of thing. But I totally agree with you. I think that's really what it was, is that's how you get from eight to 25 is we all understood what the expectations were. And then you just you, you broke the exact rule we laid out and talked about and, and made clear. Also, and I don't know if this is right or wrong. Like, but this suspension is heavier because John Morant is a marquee name. Yeah. Like if John Conchar had done this, like John Conchar does not get suspended 25 games by the NBA. And I don't think anyone clamors for John Conchar to get suspended. I'm not even trying to pick like, I yeah. mean, maybe that's a weird one because you, you feel like the maybe um, just societally we look at like oh white guy with gun that's a hunting tradition and there's like all these terrible stereotypes of that like i mean I, like just if it's like if tyus jones had been caught with like guns twice i don't think he's getting suspended a total now of 33 games for these two things because there was something about and again i don't know if that's right or wrong because the the league has literally made a financial investment in promoting john morant they put him on national TV a ton last year. He was on Christmas Day. He's one of the bright young stars that they are promoting. And it is detrimental to the league when he gets suspended. When he, I mean, I, I don't know exactly like how it affects the NBA, like their bottom line, their ability to make money. But I would assume John Morant making these negative headlines, they consider that to be bad to their bottom line. So that part of it also makes me feel weird as a very partisan biased Grizzlies fan where I'm like, like it's like it's like if you do the, the parenting analogy, it's like if you like tell your kid we had very clear uh, expectations and you broke them. 
And then the kid you're talking to is like, my sister is playing with a gun in the street. You're like, yeah, but what do you expect from her? Like you, uh, we actually have expectations for you. That kid, we can't, we can't control that kid. So it's weird. There's, there is a double standard and there can be double standards. Like we don't have to pretend that everyone gets treated equally in the NBA. James Harden doesn't have to come to every practice if he doesn't want to. Kawhi Leonard <laughs> has to play every half of basketball. He doesn't want to like pretend, pretending everyone has to get treated the same in professional sports. We don't have to do that. But like it just adds more of this stuff when you're thinking about John ja Morant. We're like, this is strange. I think most of us like we just want it to be over. We want to fast forward to um, the end season tournament just finished, and now John ja Morant's coming back, and hopefully he doesn't do anything dumb on on social media again because it's not fun to talk about. And I don't pretend I have all the answers. Like what is correct here? What the league should be doing? What John ja Morant's people should be doing? I mean, first and foremost. You got to say it, I guess, in sports podcasting. First and foremost, we want John Morant like to take care of himself, take care of his family, take care of his career, take care of his financial situation. Like he's lost a ton of money. Like mm. this has cost him a massive, a incalculable. It is calculable. It's like forty million dollars in like just stuff he's lost from this, like the loss of the supermax contract extension. Right. Um. Like there, there's all this stuff that like he's lost because of it. We just want John Morant to be safe and healthy, and everyone around the NBA and their families to be healthy, and then like. Once that's taken care of, okay, then we can complain about like, wait, was twenty five really? Did we did it really need to be that much? And then again, like, what's next? Like, what happens when the next player, like Stephen Jackson, back in the day, got arrested for firing a gun outside of a strip club, and like he was guilty, like it went to court, and he, I think he got eight games. And so, and so it's like comparing it to old things in the past doesn't work. This is a new precedent, and now it's going to be like, what happens if something? worse or weirder that doesn't specifically fall under like the already established legal guidelines such maybe like domestic violence or getting arrested that falls under um it just all becomes uh, uncomfortable conversations there is no natural segue to the basketball aspect <laughs> let's just yeah. talk about the I fun one. stuff I had one. you want me to do it dan i got one yeah, yeah. yeah. i've been thinking of it so we will move forward, but there are those 25 games uh, that John Morant will not be participating in to start the season. And yeah. we also, you, Keith, you mentioned Tyus Jones, also not there. Marcus Smart yeah. is the guy Gone. that is yeah. on board now and mm -hmm. will be very much tasked with filling that void. Um, it seems to me like he's kind of replacing two people. Uh, maybe you can speak to just the Marcus Smart trade in general, what you think he means for this team. Are they asking too much of him? Just give me, give me, give us your your take on the smart acquisition and sort of what uh, will be asked of him, you know, for these 25 games and, and beyond. So I, I think a lot is being asked of him. I think you correctly state, and I've been pointing this out on my shows where it's like, all right, he's, he's the Tyus Jones replacement. He's the extra ball handler. And he's also the Dylan Brooks replacement. And when John ja Morant suspended, wait a minute. All right. He's now, he's the John ja Morant, Tyus Jones and Dylan Brooks. Like that's a, that's a lot for a guy who only plays about 75% of his games, you know, like he's also kind of like the, Oh, we always wanted this wing type player. Yeah. And he's filling that void that already existed. In addition to the ones that were created by departures, the John Moran yeah. suspension and the trade itself. Yeah. So like, I do worry, like if he has to be primary initiator on offense and also guard the best not like guard. He's probably better at guarding wings than, than like, you know, your deer and foxes now anyways. But like, it, it does feel like we're asking a lot of him um, in a broad sense, though. I, I do like the acquisition of Marcus Smart. Once John Morant comes back, I think the acquisition of Marcus Smart um, over Dylan Brooks, it's going to be, a, a, I think, a big win. Um, I think just having a, a, another ball handler and another passer and a guy who can play alongside Ja without, I think, a defensive drop off, actually with, with a defensive boost. Like, I think one problem that everyone knows the Grizzlies have has been half court scoring. And I do not think it like necessarily adding up Marcus Smart helps with the half court that much but i do think it gives you another look you can have and i think he can be more effective than dylan brooks was in those situations and like with tyus jones they liked playing tyus and jaw together it seemed like but i really disliked it like i kind of hated it i was like we can't we can't guard any in any like backcourt players when we do this two years ago they had some really good net ratings when tyus and Ja played together but every other year when they played together they just got destroyed on defense and it's like i don't care 
like if you post a 120 offensive rating, that's great. But like we're giving up 130, and it's like that just we're losing every time. And it and it doesn't take like a, you know, may, you know, stats and numbers lie. But it's like well, that matches my eye test. We can't contest any three pointers because er- everyone on our perimeter is like six foot two or something. And so, um, I think the acquisition of Marcus Smart should help the team a lot when fully healthy. You get a, um someone who can replicate. I think Dylan's defensive strengths, but I think. One thing Dylan was really bad at is like actual, maybe like you think of him as like a nitty gritty player, but he's actually really bad at like rebounds, chasing down loose balls. Like he's good at navigating screens. He's good at one-on-one defense, but like, you know, he's bad at offense and then he's bad at actually rebounding too. And we saw a lot of what Steven Adams went out. This team went from the elite rebounding team to, Hey, they're actually bad at rebounding. And a lot of people saw it watching the FIBA World Cup. You're like, oh, Jaron is not a, a good rebounder. And um, I don't know why Steve Kerr and the Team USA was like, what if we surrounded a one bad big rebounder with a bunch of guards who are also not good at rebounding? What if we just blame that all on Jaron for not getting rebounds? <laughs> but I digress. Um, Marcus Smart, like he's a pretty he's pretty solid. He's a rebounder, but he's like the hustle guy. And he's like the deflections, the steals, the blocks. And I do think the Grizzlies defense is going to be great. I think it actually could be better than it was even with Dylan Brooks with Marcus Smart in the fold. Um, before, though, to like go back to the suspension part, it might be a little bit rocky because you are asking Marcus Smart to do uh, quite a bit with the with the loss of Tyus Jones, Dylan Brooks, and also, oh, by the way, John Morant. Was this like the guy that you would have in Smart that you would have wanted them to consolidate some of their assets into? Or do you think that this might have been more influenced by, oh, the John Morant suspension? Like now we kind of need to check this other sort of box rather than just going to get not a Brooks replacement or just someone on the wing who can play with both Bain and Ja at the same time. Like with Smart, if you would have maybe not someone you identified, I don't think a lot of people thought he was available until the actual trade went through. Would he have been someone that you would have wanted on the Grizzlies radar if they were looking to make that consolidation trade? Okay, so... To answer, I'm going to answer part of the question. Like, was was the Ja Morant suspension, like, did that weigh in their their decision to target and pursue Marcus Smart? I would say absolutely not. Okay. Just under the very simple, like, you would not trade Tyus Jones if you were considering the Ja Morant suspension. Like, you just flat out wouldn't do it. Like, that doesn't make it, that doesn't make any sense. And um, so I think, no, I, I don't think the, the suspension weighed in at all. Like, Maybe they said we had to get at least somebody who can dribble a basketball, but I don't think that had any factor. I think they got Marcus Smart for how Marcus Smart fits when John Morant is back, and they're focusing on the playoffs. They've had a ton of regular season success the past two years, and I think they knew two years ago they were like, all right, I don't totally trust our 56 wins. We're maybe not totally built for the playoffs, and like they made some theoretical moves. Like These are better archetypes of players for the playoffs i thought they were horrible moves because you're like yeah uh jake laravia in theory is maybe like a postseason player but like he's an unproven rookie and so like they they got a bunch of rookies last summer um and um i so i think marcus smart continues the idea of like this is a postseason guy we can depend on this is a guy with experience you know late rounds of the playoffs and he does provide some extra ball handling while also not sacrificing our, our perimeter defense. Now, the very first part of your question, you're like, was this the right guy for the consolidation trade? Um, as a fan or an analyst or a fanalist, if you will, the um, the trade for Marcus Smart, like, I like it, and I think Marcus Smart is a great fit on the Grizzlies, but the only times I don't like it is when I think of it in the context of the idea of this being, oh, was this our big move? that like we've been waiting for for years Mm -hmm. and when i think of it in the context of like oh we traded that warriors first round pick that top four protected warriors first rounder in 2024 that we've been holding forever it's like we made andre Iguodala mad for this we like did all stuff like like, we've had so much we went through so much stuff like to get this pick and it was always like years ago it was man we got the we got the Jazz 22 pick. We got the Lakers 23 pick. We got the we, we, like, it was always like you're, you're always counting your future assets. And it's like one day we could trade all those picks and we could get whoever. And it was like we could get Jalen Brown if we traded all these picks. And so like and then as the years went by and this happens for everybody, like heads up, Sam Presti, like this happens for everybody that you eventually you start using those picks. 
And you're like, oh, we used two of our picks on Jake LaRavia. And, and then it's like, oh, fast forward. All right, now we finally made our trade and we sent two future picks and Tyus Jones for Marcus Smart. And you're like, ah, that's okay. But like, it's not like a super, it's like you get super excited about it. And then when you like, you further like draw the, whatever, the view back and you're like, oh, so a year after we traded DeAnthony Melton for David Roddy, we then traded Tyus Jones in two firsts for a better Melton in Marcus Smart. And it's like Melton plus Tyus Jones plus two firsts for Roddy and Smart. Like that's kind of a, it feels like a lateral move, not mm -hmm. like a super. It's like we, we like I think getting Marcus Smart made us better, but only because we made ourselves worse last off season. Mm -hmm. And so like, again, when, when you, this is maybe this is like podcaster brain problems. Or like when you cover the team like daily or multiple times a week for years and you remember back to, all right, trade deadline of 2022, it was like, all right, we're going to have cap space. We're going to have three extra picks. We're going to have, we have uh, Melton and we have Brooks and we have Tyus Jones and those are all tradable contracts and we have these guys and these guys. And if we package all that together, we can get all that stuff. And now you're like, uh, Tyus Jones is gone. Dylan Brooks is gone. Kyle Anderson, he left. Um, D'Anthony Melton, he's gone. Brandon Clark's injured. And all of the extra picks we had, that became Marcus Smart and Jake LaRavia. And it's like, if you, if, like, because like, I'm generally optimistic, but I do get criticized we're like hey you're you're kind of down on the grizzlies a lot and, and I, i'm like i'm not really like i don't think i am like if you're telling me you went back in time two years ago in the middle of the 2022 season and you're like hey guess what going into the 2023 2024 season john moran's going to be suspended 25 games brandon clark's going to have a torn achilles and all of our bench that we're so proud of and dylan brooks and all of our draft picks turned into marcus smart and jake laravia you would not be happy. You would be like, what? Yeah. Like that. We didn't get anything. We, we thought we were adding Pascal Siakam or OG Ananobi or whoever else. We thought we were going to trade all of our future picks for these things. And now we don't have any extra future picks going forward. The Grizzlies still have their own picks. Like they could still trade, but like you no longer have that. Oh, it's I'm super optimistic for our bright future. The bright future is the guys you have in house. You have, you have John Morant, you have Desmond Bain, you have Jerry Jackson Jr. On Honestly, like no other teams probably have as good of a young core or, you know, you can argue a few like the Thunder or the Pelicans or whatever. But like we're still have all these great things and we're still have a bright future because of that. But my pushback is like, yeah, but I had those things two years ago. Like I already had those things. I thought I was getting those things and more. And now you're telling me, what about Marcus Smart? Like, OK, <laughs> that's kind of that's, that's fun. Like he's pretty good. Like it's pretty good, yeah. but it's no longer this like, oh my God, we're gonna be a dynasty. It's now like, yeah, we should be competitive. We we like we we got a chance, you know, like we, we got a chance to make the conference finals, probably. We're not a favorite by any stretch of the imagination, but when healthy, we should we should be able to, to basically face down with anybody and we're gonna be underdogs to the best teams, but like that's fine. Um it, I don't know. It's just like I know I've been going on for a real long time now, but the uh it's just like the change of perspective where it's like it used to be so optimistic. And now I'm like talking myself into, yeah, this is why the Marcus Smart trade's good. Yeah, I don't think that's unique to you. I can remember Dan and I specifically talking about, oh, the Grizzlies are so primed. Like, look at all this young talent they have. It's so projectable and they have all this stuff. What are they going to turn that into? And, and like you say, it's Marcus Smart. I do think, though, I mean, all the other stuff that they had independent of the picks and, and all this, you know, that's still really good. And Desmond Bain, I think, is kind of we haven't talked about him hardly at all. Uh, and he's relevant for several reasons, not the least of which is his fat new contract he got. Uh, what do you think about the numbers that he, that he, you know, the years and dollars? And, and then with specific respect to these first 25 games, if you're looking for playmaking assistance, like, is he someone that you could see? We know what he does really well already. Uh, is he someone that you could see expanding that aspect of his game to where it's not just Marcus Smart trying to, be a conventional point guard for, you know, more than a quarter of the season. Can Desmond Bain run more pick and rolls? Is, is that something, is that asking too much of him? I feel like we're already talking about, we've asked too much of Marcus Smart. Uh, just what, what are your Desmond Bain thoughts? How, how much better can he get and in what ways? And will that be of particular, you know, need, especially early this year? 
We will no. include like a warning for any Celtics fans that might be listening. That's yeah, no, it's big shout out to the Celtics for uh, salary dumping the, the draft rights of Desmond Bain to the Grizzlies. Um, yeah, Desmond Bain's awesome. And anytime like you, you get down thinking about like maybe the way you might have mismanaged the roster, it's like, but we still have Desmond Bain. We still have John Morant. We still have Jaron Jackson Jr. And those guys are awesome. And Desmond Bain, they could talk about the, the contract he got. For me, it's a no brainer. I think it was ten, it was technically not a max. Um, yeah. But it's like the uh, it looks like the max. I mean, it's just look at look rank the best shooting guards in the NBA. Just for me, it's that simple. It's like, all right, Devin Booker. And it's like, all right, now, now who are we talking about? Like, uh, you'd rather have him than like, like he's better than Bradley Beal. And it's like, he's better than, you know, like you just again, look at it. It's like he's one of the he's one of the best shooting guards in the NBA right now. And I think he can improve the, the playmaking. You mentioned Grant. Like, yeah, he's going to be on the ball constantly uh, the first 25 games. I mean, I think he's going to average five or six assists through his first 25 games. He's going to, I mean, I, I like fantasy basketball people, like he's going to average like 28, five and five. I think the first, you know, two months of the season. Um, and I think the way he can improve is just continue the ball handling. Um, I think getting the foul line more, he's an elite free throw shooter, but he doesn't, he hasn't, totally mastered the five or six free throw attempts per game. Um, so I think like if he can improve that some, and honestly, like last year was a, it was a, a near all-star level season. Um, it was a, a breakout season and I think he was hurt for most of it. Like his, uh, his first 13 games. And that's including like, I, I think the first two or three games, he couldn't hit anything. And then he got a 10 game stretch where he was like, uh, I don't know what to call him. Like, it was just like, all NBA level, Devin Booker, like knocking down all except Devin Booker with, with a better three point shot. You know, like he was, he was outrageously good. Then he hurt his toe. He missed a bunch of time. He came back. His, all his shooting splits went way down. He's still like, you wouldn't know it if you were just like checking out his overall splits. You're like, Oh yeah, that guy's amazing. He is, but I think he actually was hurt most of last year. So I think he can get better there. And just, then just the natural progression of a guy, like, you know, getting a few years of the league under his belt. Yeah. I think, I think Justin Bain, he's like a, trendy pick like first time all-stars in the west like jamal murray he's gonna get it but like i think desmond bain especially because of the john morant suspension like he's gonna go nuts at the beginning of the year and i think desmond bain is probably one reason why grizzlies fans can be super optimistic like i don't know if jerry can level up again like he leveled up last year john yeah. morant already an all nba type player if desmond bain then becomes like a top 30 top 20 player there then you're like well they, they have this big three who cares if they're surrounded by um zaire williams and john conchar and whoever else you mentioned jaron jackson jr he feels unnecessarily polarizing to me just because i understand the criticisms the rebounding the fouling can still be a problem but then i'm wondering do we read too much into the rebounding because he does spend he can spend a lot of time like look at where he's defending away from the basket if we could track that relative to other bigs i think he's going to stand near the top of that. Whereas like, it's the same thing that could be with Evan Mobley, even when he's kind of like the lone big lineups with, with Cleveland, how concerning are Jaron Jackson Jr.'s continued weaknesses. And you mentioned that you're wondering whether he can continue to level up, level up. What was something about last season? And I'm assuming it came on the offensive end because he was just so much more, or looked like he was so much more of a complete player there. Um, what is just something that really impressed you about his growth? Last well, year? it's, it's, it's wild. I mean, he leveled up, in every area, like he leveled up defensively. Sure. He led the NBA in blocks per game two years ago. And of course he did it again last year. Um, he just, he got better and better at defense. He can guard basically anyone. His block numbers were ridiculous. They're spectacular. And yeah, his, um, his finishing got so much better this year. And even his three point shot, it went from, he's been all over the place with his three point shot. And it had been two years ago. It was bad. And last mm -hmm. year it got back up to like, no, oh, Okay. You know, and like just being okay is really, really good, but his two point finishing skyrocketed. And so, like, he started making all his two pointers again. He had a really good field goal percentage. Um, and you mentioned like it's weird how he's polarizing, he's the most unnecessarily polarizing. Like, this goes to how we talk about all NBA players. Everyone's like, oh, Jaron should rebound better. Like, it's like, well, yeah, like if Jaron was Ben Wallace or Andre Drummond on the glass. 
He's like a top five NBA player. He can't right. be a top five. Like, why, why does everyone have to be elite? This goes back, like, Dan, we've talked about this a lot, where they're like, oh, man, if Dylan Brooks could, like, shoot less and be more efficient, or, like, <laughs> like, like, if you package he that. express his strongest innermost. Yeah, what, but it was just like, <laughs> man, if, if this, if this all defensive level, like, three could add a, a higher three-point percentage or like better scoring, you're like, yes, he would be an all-star. Like we all wish he would be Paul George, but like players aren't that. <laughs> and so like, again, Jaron getting criticized last year, like the foul trouble is one thing. He does get in foul trouble. It's overblown because I think when we talk about sports, we have to have just like one single bullet point thing to talk about. And maybe some of that's just the way ESPN and other networks cover the, the league. Like Jaron, I think, fouled out of four games last year. He played low minutes because they the Grizzlies don't play anybody heavy minutes, just period. Like they don't play anybody heavy minutes. Um, his his fouls are, are still a problem, despite the fact like the, but there's nuance. Like, yeah, he, he's not always fouling out, but sure, we wish the fouling was less. The rebounding thing, it's just like compare his rebounds per possession to like who do you want? Like Chris Bosch? Like they're pretty close. It's like he's he's not elite at rebounding. And I would I I call him like average. I was like showing people, I'm like, hey, who do you think had more rebounds per possession, Pal Gasol on the Grizzlies or Jaron. And again, it's really, really close. They're like within like tenths of a rebound per possession. Like, and so it's just like, um, I think Jaron's weaknesses are overstated. I think the rebounding, he's not good at it. But like, God, you can't be good at everything. You can't be the world's best rim protector or one of the five best rim protectors who also can switch out on the perimeter. Like he had all these games last year with like five blocks and two steals and five, whatever. Like no one else in the NBA did that last year. And I, I legit saw someone be like, well, like, like you can, you can average three blocks and one steal and also like be a great rebounder. Like look at Hakeem Olajuwon. <laughs> it's like, it's okay. It's not Hakeem Olajuwon. It's done. Yeah. It's like, all right, it's been done. But it's like, why does every player have to be the best player ever? And it's like, Jared is really good for it. He is. So I, I do think he, he suffers some from, uh, like the Carl Anthony Towns thing of like, he is frustrating to watch at times because of the fouls. And like, they've had some notable, like when you lose playoff games and like you fouled out. All right. People remember that when you lose on Christmas state of the warriors and you get in foul trouble, it just reinforces the biggest stereotype. Cause like, Oh, that's what I thought about this guy. It's been reinforced. Right. This one Grizzlies game I watched in December was them losing on the road to the warriors. And he was in foul trouble. So thus Jaron has foul trouble. Um, I think the fouls are a legit thing he can clean up. The rest of it, it's like, I mean, like, if you want a rebounder, go get a rebounder. But Jaron might be the best defender in the NBA. He was voted the best defender in the NBA last year. I'll take that over, like, whoever who's, like, really great at, guy, like, um, I love Kevon Looney, but like, give me Jaron over Kevon Looney. I'm sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, everyone, <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know when this is coming out, Dan and Grant, but like, the talk this week is like, what if Team USA had Kevon Looney instead of Jaron? It's like, <laughs> well, they, they would have won every game by four. They would have won every game. Why not both? Is it's an okay argument. Sure. But Domas Sabonis would have been in trouble if they had dude, Kevon Yeah, Looney. boy. Completely irrelevant, but we need to nationalize Steven Adams. I, um, <laughs> So <laughs> we've hit uh, the Jaron Jackson thing makes yeah. me because you mentioned that. Yeah, he can definitely cut the cut the fouls in a perfect world. That's kind of the low hanging fruit. This is a team that's won 50 plus games, two years running. But everybody sort of agrees and not to keep harping on like, oh, but they don't do this. What is the low hanging fruit for the Grizzlies? Because there's some things to pick from that they could, you know, get from that team that's in the low to mid 50s and wins. And then maybe, you know, not necessarily improve that total so much because who really cares? But be a bigger playoff threat. Is it the half court scoring? Is it the, you know, their bottom 10 and three point accuracy? Is it uh, the rebounding when Steven Adams is not involved? Like what's the low hanging fruit that if you're a Grizzlies fan, you can say like, if we just kind of tick these boxes collectively, you know, this is how we sort of progress to the, to becoming a team in sort of that next tier. Yeah. I think the low hanging fruit continues to be the half court offense. And I, I don't know if it's been, fixed by any stretch of the imagination um the grizzlies the last two years or so two years ago they were elite at transition opportunities they were always scoring in the paint they were turning everybody over constantly they've been really good at defense the past two seasons um a lot of that kind of uh failed when steven adams went out they're still fine at defense but like steven adams actually getting the rebounds stopping the possessions for the other team that was um unfortunately a much bigger 
cog uh, to the Grizzlies' success than uh, maybe most of us hoped it was. I thought and it was getting like, second chances on offense. I mean, that right. was a huge yeah. So, part of so, it. so the Grizzlies' offense the last two years um, has been like. John Morant will score if he doesn't. Stephen Adams will get the rebound, and then everybody else. It was basically, hey, Dylan, just just get it on the rim, like just get on the rim, man, and like we're good. And that was no literally problem. that's been the Grizzlies' offense, honestly, the entire um, John Morant era. Before it was Stephen Adams, it was Jonas Valanciunas. It was just mm-hmm. get the ball on the rim, we'll get second chance opportunities. And I think they rightly thought, all right, going back to the Stephen Adams Jonas Valanciunas trade, they're like, we got to have a better offense. We can't just let Jonas. Do it. We, we want Jaron to grow as an offensive player. We want to depend more on the other players. So let's do this trade. But then Stephen Adams, you know, I think it turned out as well as they could have hoped. Like the Stephen Adams trade was huge for the Grizzlies and it led to their success. But also, um, I think maybe we got a little too addicted to Stephen Adams is doing everything. And maybe that is a place that maybe like I'm not an NBA trainer. Maybe Jaron can get better as a rebounder, you know, like, like, but like he's okay at it, but like, you got to have other players who rebound. One of my big frustrations with some of the rosters, like um, I'm notoriously like uh, uh, obsessed with D'Anthony Melton, like D'Anthony Melton and Kyle Anderson and then Brandon Clark. Those were your good rebounders outside of Steven Adams. And so the, the Brandon Clark thing, you can't control that. He gets hurt, but it's like one of the problems when we looked at the roster, even last off season going into the year, it's like, Oh, they got rid of, um, they got rid of two of their better rebounders for their positions in Melton and Kyle Anderson. They also got rid of their two best steals guys. And it was just like, this was a team that was built on rebounding second chances, second chance points, and then forcing turnovers. How's that going to work if you got rid of like the depth pieces? Um, and then it turned out like they were still good. They weren't as good, but they had to find new ways to do it. They weren't causing as many turnovers. Um, but I think, Jaron and Desmond Bain stepped up last season, and that's why you saw similar regular season success. Those guys both got better. Then when Steven Adams went down, it was, um, you got the trade deadline, you get Luke Kennard. And so now, actually, and it's hard to, it's hard to gauge post-trade deadline regular season basketball because whatever. It's like you, you see a lot of unsustainable trends. But like the Grizzlies got good at hitting three-pointers, and all of a sudden they became like a decent three-point shooting team. And their defense trailed off a little bit. So I think the, I think the dream is, and maybe this is the low hanging fruit. Just if you get all your bodies back, if you get Steven Adams and Luke Kennard, well, now suddenly you have like a really formidable, like top six or so, even if you have a question mark about the small forward spot, just assuming Bain and smart are going to be the wings alongside John Morant. And then Jaron and Steven Adams are healthy. You got Luke Kennard off the bench. Like you got some stuff and I think their offense could be better um, and their defense, I think, is going to be absolutely elite for the third straight year. Whether that transitions into the playoffs, I'm not uh, convinced at all because I think Marcus Smart, for a lot of like, he does bring playoff experience. He does not bring efficient scoring. He does not provide off the ball scoring. It's going to be how much of his just hustle plays, deflections, and then his ball handling. Maybe that alone can help the offense, but like if you need a bucket, it's still going to be clear out. Maybe that's something Desmond Bain can add to his game, become an even better um, ISO score. He's already pretty decent at it, but I am not as like bullish that they've fixed or corrected their um, their postseason woes of, of gotcha. struggling to score in the half court. I honestly wonder if the John Morant suspension could almost help them in the sense of just self exploration. You're talking about Desmond Bain being put in those one on one situations, and I also just wonder going from Dylan Brooks to Marcus Smart, where if you look over the last three years, their catch and shoot three point numbers are eerily similar. Yeah. Marcus Smart is defended way differently from beyond the arc than Dylan Brooks ever was. And so now you're talking about even when they're at full strength, you should be able to open up the floor more having Luke Kennard, Marcus Smart, not being Dylan Brooks. And so I do wonder, I don't really know what that looks like with Steven Adams in the fold, but as you already mentioned, like when he was out, they couldn't be as reliant on offensive rebounding. And they had about a league average half court offense during that stretch. So those lineups with Jaron Jackson Jr. at the five or just a different type of front court, I'm wondering if those could actually be more weaponized um, offensively in the half court now that you have Marcus Smart and, and Luke Kennard at the same time. Yeah, and even like a guy we haven't mentioned his name once, um, Santi Aldama had a lot of success sharing the court with Jaron. And I think even if you think about the the lineup experimentations they're going to do without John Morant, you're going to have like – you're going to definitely going to do some Jaron and Santi at the four and five. And then just like, I think, I think Luke Kennard, Desmond Bain and Marcus smart are going to be like, it's going to be rocket fuel. Like that's going to be like, I think a really strong offensive lineups, um, whether Xavier Tillman, who 
did a pretty solid job filling in for Steven Adams. Unfortunately, his limitations, he's not as good at any of the things that Steven Adams does mm -hmm. um, as far. He's a very good one-on-one -on -one defender, but like he can't rebound at the same level by any stretch of the imagination. Um, like I, I think it's going to be interesting because again, like w when you hit the level the Grizzlies are at where you've made the postseason, you've had home court advantage two years in a row. Now you're going to the third year and it's like, you never know if things are fixed until basically you get to April. And so, right. and so it's like, um, th that's going to be hard. That's why I also uh, always tell basketball fans, like enjoy every month. Every month is fun. Like we're here to watch basketball. We don't have to get too obsessed with, uh, with, with like the postseason breakdown, but I think there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of lineups that like they can tinker around with and maybe guys can find their footing um, while John Morant is unavailable. I have a very scientific question for you, Keith. Uh, is Zaire Williams still a thing? Like, is there, and, and maybe that's unfair because know, Dan man. and I obsess over this guy. He was very much for us. I think representative of like, Oh man, look, just what if, if he, you know, it kind of Desmond Bain sort of became that, which is like, yeah. Oh, if this home sort pseudo homegrown cause the trade, but if he pops, boy, they really got something. And Williams, like, you know, injuries made it unfair to evaluate him last year a little bit, I think. But just the idea of this guy at what? I think he just turned 22, like today, maybe, or yesterday. Yeah. As a 21-year-old, or maybe 20, he started several games down the stretch as a rookie and, like, looked at least really promising, like, player type-wise. You know, what are your expectations for him? Is he still someone the Grizzlies... Uh, view as you know a key piece or are the Roddies and you know Conchars and Aldamas like sort of ahead of him now in terms of importance and projectability I would say Aldama's definitely ahead of him um I, I mean I don't have any answers like you, every question you ask is good but I don't know anybody who knows well like, is he a thing is not a great is, question is, 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 is it, no fun. is he a thing I would lean to no um okay. Which again, a non-scientific answer. They're hoping he is. Yeah. Um, his teammates have been talking him up, like, mm -hmm. "Oh, you guys are going to see what you know Zaire does the next year." But like, yeah, I mean, that was a high draft investment. You know, they, they picked him tenth. They traded up uh, to get him as part of that Stephen Adams Jonas Valanciunas trade. Um, he had a promising rookie year, but um, even his rookie year, like. He's an athlete, which is great. Like he lob finisher, the Grizzlies needed those. They were very exciting. They got a lot of transition opportunities, and he was that vertical spacing threat in the half court. You know, like he could even be in the dunker spot, or he would cut baseline. You know, like catch teams sleeping on defense. And then it was all about the three point shot. And the the latter half of the of the year, his rookie season, he made some threes. And then in the Warriors series, I think he had one game where he knocked on a couple threes. And so everyone's like, "Oh, this rookie, he's like, oh, he's on the trajectory to be good, to be that wing with size and shooting that every team needs." And then he was just awful. Just mm -hmm. awful last year. And like, I've always been a bit, I've been more on the skeptical side with Zaire because I don't, here's something very scientific. I don't feel like he has feel. Uh, oh no, that's a big yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't like, I don't, he looks like, he looks like 2k animation strung together when he does things where it's like, oh yeah, he just did his dribble move and now he looks up. All right, now he passed, but none of it, it never flows. Nothing ever flows one into the other. And mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, he knew Roddy was going to be there. It was like, oh, he looked up, saw him, said, I should pass. And then he passed. And you're like, no, that's a split second too late. You got to just do it. You got to just know. And so, like, I've always thought, like, even when he makes jumpers, like, you know, he can make a mid range jumper. And he clearly, like, all NBA players works incredibly hard at these skills. And, like, you see him on the court, you're like, oh, he made that one. But it was kind of like, there's like the split second of, like, I'm going to do my move now. And then he does his <laughs> move. And it's like, I don't. Yeah, so like I've never been a big fan where I'm like I don't. I had a long running thing also like like uh, he's not he's not super good at anything. Like he he doesn't rebound, he doesn't steal, he doesn't block shots, he doesn't he doesn't do the hustle plays. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so it's like if, if you don't it, like he, I know you can catch lobs, but like the athleticism term should also apply to like maybe not just catching lobs. Like you can't not particularly good at defense, and if you're not getting rebounds and you're not forcing turnovers, and then your shooting is a question mark. What are you? And it's like, I have no idea. And so, like, I obviously, as a Grizzlies fan, I hope he bounces back because there's a there's great opportunity for somebody, right. for Zaire Williams or David Roddy or Jake LaRavia or Vince Williams Jr. or anybody to do something. at the, Any small forward minutes not being played with Marcus Smart or Desmond Bain, like, they're going to play a lot of small ball. Luke Kennard's going to play a lot. Marcus Smart's going to play a lot. Desmond Bain will play as much as they can. Beyond that, anyone... 
it's just like somebody do something, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, I, I don't know. It like, it's going to be a fun preseason training camp battle. Um, or it might be a horrible training camp battle where it's like, Nope, none of these guys. And then he's matching salary. And then it's like, <laughs> that's just cause legit, that's the way the NBA works. Like what if he's making five or 6 million? Cause he got drafted in the lottery. So it's like, it becomes matching salary and they, they turn it over to one of the, one of the other guys they drafted the year after him. We are entering the cookie cutter portion of the podcast, which I know everyone's just excited about. And you actually desire William talk was a good segue into this. When they're at full strength, their starting five is set smart, Bain, Morant, Adams, Jaron Jackson, Jr. How does the rest of that, if you had to predict right now, before we're getting into training camp, the rest of their 10 man rotation shake out. Um, I probably could have prepared this. Uh, let's see. Definitely Luke Kennard. Definitely Santi Aldama. I would say definitely Santi Aldama is just a lock now. He had a great season. Like 100%. That. 100% Santi Aldama is a lock. It, it, would, it would be stunning if he got um, DMPs in my mind. I mean, I, but th like th there's the opportunity, though. This well, is, of course, Bra yeah. of course, Brandon Clark is not. I'm not penciling him in for any minutes this year. I mean, hopefully he's around in March. They're acting like he's going to be, but mm -hmm. I'll believe it when I see it. Um, so your backcourt, I mean, your front court is set off the bench because I think Tillman and Aldama have that locked up. Kennard is going to play. And then beyond that... Is Rose going to play? I know with Morant out, he probably will, but they gave him two guaranteed years. But And when John Morant's back, is that someone who plays? When, when Morant is back, I would not expect Derek Rose to play. Although, okay. again, he's going to have every opportunity to show he still has something in the tank. Um, but I would assume your bench is going to be Kennard. They're going to, they're going to, all the point guard minutes are going to be played by John Morant, Desmond Bain, or Marcus Smart. Those guys are going to handle all the ones, and you're going to play Luke Kennard. And I think that one regret, honestly, they have last year is not playing Luke Kennard even more. Like they, they didn't play him enough that they didn't they didn't turn it over to John Morant and Luke Kennard and Desmond Bain all playing together. They have one of the most hysterical like three man lineup net ratings ever last year. I can't remember. I should look this up. It was it was something like they played 150 regular season possessions plus 48 net rating. They played 130 postseason like lineup possessions together plus 49 net rating. And so it's like they absolutely smoked when they went with this small ball. Of course, those are outliers, and but I do think they wish they played it more. And so I think those guard minutes are, are going to be full when fully healthy. And I don't think they're going to play Derrick Rose. I look just now, yeah. cleaning the glass, 40.4 net rating with Bain, Kennard, and Ja on the court <laughs> in the regular season. Yeah. And I want to be good. The, the, playoff, the, offensive the playoff one's better. I'm just telling you right now, the playoff one's better. But um, the uh, I don't think there's going to be minutes for Derrick Rose. The, the question then becomes, so that's eight that I feel certain. Kennard, Aldama, Tillman off the bench. I think it's going to be Roddy. And then I think it's going to be Conchar. Conchar weirdly has an extension that kicks in next year. So like Conchar's locked in for a long time. Um, but I don't know. Th then you start picking between maybe it is Derek Rose. Maybe it is Jake LaRavia. Maybe it is Zaire Williams. And I, uh, I, I doubt anyone who says they have any answer to what it's actually going to be. Well, you mentioned the small lineup that, uh, well, guard wise, with respect to the closing lineup, is Adams someone you envision closing a lot, or do we see Jackson at the five with uh, some other combination of, you know, all the mainstays will be in there? But do you do you envision them going smaller to close, or is Adams someone that you think will be out there late, or, or maybe I'm not even mentioning who you think will be out there to close most games? Obviously, it's matchup dependent in a lot of cases, but generally speaking, yeah. So it's wild because with these multiple years of having this big center, Steven Adams, and then before that was Jonas Valanciunas, they were never the preferred when it got really intense. They were not the preferred closing option. They would go with Brandon Clark most of the time. It would mm -hmm. be Jaron and Brandon. So, so now Brandon's out, and that, like, once again, thrusts Steven Adams back up higher in, in, like, importance. And I do think, yeah, he's absolutely going to be, like, the, the closing option. I think the closing lineups... Like, I don't have any worry about the closing lineups, both with and without Ja, if everybody's healthy. I think Ja Morant, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart, Jaron Jackson Jr., and Steven Adams is awesome. Like, that's that's going to be a problem for literally everyone. Like, maybe um, the Suns having, you know, we don't have anyone to guard Kevin Durant. Not many people do. And like, right. all right, the Nuggets, yeah, all right, the Nuggets are good. Um, but like, I think that's a, an elite five. Honestly, when Ja Morant's out, I think same 
defensive wing issues, but like Kennard, Bain, Marcus Smart with Jaron and Steven Adams, that's also a really good like five. I think it's gonna be really tough for a lot of people. So I don't have like a creative, I don't have like a creative, like, oh, I'm really dying to see this lineup. Mm -hmm. Like, no, uh, we have seven good players. I'd like those players to play. <laughs> So there's no, the question I ask every year, there's no uh -huh. weirdo, quirky, wonky lineup you want to see them try. I would say my only, my only, if it's weirdo, there's like non John Morant lineups that like entice me. Like the, like Luke Kennard really won me over. I was, I was, when, when they traded for him last year, I was very lukewarm, not to use the term Luke again. No, I'm gonna stick with it. I was very lukewarm about the Kennard trade. And, um, Hitting 55% of your three pointers uh, will win a guy over. And that's what he did on the Grizzlies. And um, so, like, and also, and honestly, this is this goes to another problem with like the, the team rebounding. I say this as both a compliment and a criticism. Luke Kennard was like the third best Grizzlies rebounder. And I was like, <laughs> like, that's good for Luke. It's terrible for everybody else. But like, I'm like, I will look at least like there's that thing again where it's like it's the feel. Like Luke understands if the shots going up, I need to be moving, moving, moving. The ball's probably coming over here. We had several guys who weren't like that. They're just like, oh, the ball went over there. Who knew? Well, it's like some people knew. Like you know, they, they've seen enough basketball. They understand that. Um, so like, I think Luke Hart's a pretty solid uh, rebounder, and I love the idea of Kennard, Bain, and Marcus Smart playing. And then like the thing I mentioned before, that with Aldama and Jaron Jackson Jr. Maybe that's my most weird five man lineup that I really want to watch uh, for the Grizzlies this season. That was actually mine, except I wanted no bones about Desmond Bain being the point guard. So I'd rather you sub out Marcus Smart, throw in Zaire Williams. And so like then you're just Desmond Bain plus a bunch of like bigger players, but aren't too big. So I it's more of like a not a morbid curiosity, but it's just a curiosity. What would that look like? I would like to see that's, it. Yeah, I don't I we're trying so hard to make Zaire Williams happen. You guys are it's, it's, so it's like it's not it's not fetch. It's not gonna happen, guys. Like, um, he's a credit, he did for like I tweeted about Zaire Williams a couple times during his rookie season about how impressed I was. And each time Keith would quote tweet it and like pump the brakes on it. Be like, well, this is like skewed because he shot a million percent against the Knicks or well, something. And that, no, I, mean, I don't, I don't mean to be the douse water on guy, but sometimes no, right. that, that was, <laughs> yeah. that was probably during that stretch where I'm like, he hasn't grabbed a defensive rebound in 400 minutes or, 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 or whatever it was, or like Zaire hasn't drawn a charge in three years. Uh, you know, like um, there was a bunch of little hustle stats. No, it was deflections. This is what it was. I'm not remembering again. I, Maybe I could have prepped. It's not like I think about the Grizzlies every day. Um, Zaire Williams has the spectacular lack of deflection marks and lack of loose balls recovered. And there was this thing. I was tracking it last year where I'm like, Zaire Williams has still not recovered a loose ball. And like the top 10, and I am going back to the skeptic thing. I'm very skeptical of the NBA hustle stats page. Like, I'm not saying they're faking it. Like they're, they're definitely tracking things. The value of the things they're tracking I'm very skeptical of, and I shouldn't say that as we just picked up the uh, reigning two-time hustle award winner, Marcus right. Smart. Um, I had an entire podcast episode basically about how, like, I'm not sure how they applied their hustle stats and came out with Marcus Smart as the winner because he's not high in any of these categories. But uh, it was like the, the loose balls recovered. It was like Zaire Williams and a bunch of bigs in their 30s. <laughs> and it was like the only people I'm like, how is this 21 year old not just accidentally picked up a loose ball? And people are like, people would be like adding me on Twitter and be like, Hey, I think he got one. I'm like, that might, I'm like, that might've been a rebound. That might've been a rebound. We'll have to wait and see how it scored. And like, Oh, they scored it as a rebound. Sorry, Zaire. Well, um, no, <laughs> this all adds scientific heft to your, he doesn't have feel. That, that's like a qualitative you, thing. If you don't get deflections, you don't get loose balls, you don't get rebounds, you, you can't really assist. Like, it is. Like, I don't... He can, nominated him for does the least with the most award. That's what you've uh, done. I but, I mean, th they stopped playing him last year. And, like, he got, he got healthy. He, yes, he struggled with injury last year, but, like, he fell behind basically everyone in the rotation. And so maybe they'll give him a, a chance, like, to regain that. But it is sad because, like, I feel like... I feel like my, like calling card as a Grizzlies podcaster was just being like, and maybe most podcasters, team specific podcasters are like this. You latch on, you like, you, you grab your data points and you're like, but just look at the numbers when these guys play. And yeah. like, these are, or also like this guy plays how I like guys to play. And so when now I'm like, I, I'm like doing this confirmation bias. Like I like that guy. And then I found this stat and now I'm going to hammer it home. And then it just keeps happening. Look how good they do when these guys play. And like, I felt like all my years, like the first three years I did grits and grinds, I was like passionate. I'm like, the Grizzlies are good. But when this, like I, I wouldn't even do like when any of these eight guys play, we're awesome. 
And I was so passionate every single year. And last year was the first year where I was like, outside of our best four, I, I don't care. Like they're whatever. Like I don't like I don't ever, people are like, hey, should Taylor Jenkins should Taylor Jenkins have gone with uh whoever? Like, like, should Roddy have finished? I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, I'd like all these guys are the same to me, and I don't have a strong opinion on any of them. And it was just like when I would just I'm like, I'd, I'd play Conchar. Like, and they're like, what? Because everyone's frustrated because, like, Conchar is this very known quantity or a known entity. Like, where I'm like, Conchar's not terrible. Like, I don't know. Zaire's terrible a lot. And David Roddy, like, anytime a rookie does anything good, you're like, oh, he's pretty good. But, like, flat out, he was terrible a lot. And that's just what happens with rookies. And so I, I've become this, like, and I, and I worry it's made my product worse. I don't have a strong, passionate opinion about, like, Oh yeah, we, like we gotta play Kenneth Lofton Jr. It's like I'm more like. Well, you do. Yeah, we we do. <laughs> Maybe it's just aging. You lose your edge. You don't care anymore. You're just like, man. The coaches, they see him. They probably know best. And everyone's like, <laughs> shut up, man. I feel like you're describing my exact trajectory as an analyst right now. Yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like, you company man. It's like they don't, <laughs> they don't care what I say. Like I don't, like I, no one's proven they're good. No one's proven they're good to me on the back half of the roster. So it's like, yeah, put play Luke Kennard 35 minutes. Like you didn't like the trade. That's right. I didn't, but guess what? He's good. Let's, let's play him. Let's play, play that him. guy. And I, I don't care who they develop, figure it out. Um, and please get me some more talent on this team. <laughs> Keith, I know you got to go. So we will yeah. end here. They're yeah. over under as of September 12th, 2023, Ooh. 46 and a half. Mm. Would you go over or under on that? And where do you see them just kind of stacking up relative to the rest of the West? Well, all right. How, where do I see them stacking up? relative to the rest of the West. I think when they're healthy, I think they're probably in that like fourth to sixth best team. Um, maybe yeah, I think the team, when you look at that, because the West is, it's going to be brutal, but it's also kind of wide open. I think Denver and Phoenix are probably the only teams I would just be prepared to say are better than anyone at this point. I'm like, out on Phoenix. I'm out on Phoenix. I'm planting my flag. Um, well, then there you go. So the, the, the Grizzlies are the second best team in the West. There's only the Nuggets in front of them. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think we can beat. Um, I think the Lakers are, are much better than the Grizzlies. Um, I think the Nuggets are better than the Grizzlies. I think, I think the Warriors and Suns are problematic for the Grizzlies. Um, but I think they're in the mix. I think they're there. But, of course, the Grizzlies aren't healthy. Um, Steven Adams was hurt, and it was a big, that, 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 was, a, that was a big weird end of the year where he was out for three to five weeks and never came back and it was months. And so like, and John Moran, of course is suspended and has to not get suspended again. And Marcus smart plays 65 games every year. And it's like Jaron had a healthy year last year, even with missing the first, I can't remember how many games he missed at the beginning of the year. Like Jaron played under 60 games last year. And so all of that mixed together makes me a little apprehensive of like, uh, I don't know. And of course the depth, I feel like this year, this year's challenge has been, they're really leaning into trusting their own infrastructure. Like they have been good in the regular season for two straight years, regardless of who suited up, regardless of who was there every night. And they keep in my mind, chopping away at the depth. It's like, Oh, that was the case. But now like Tyus Jones and Dylan Brooks are gone and they played tons of minutes and the way the dylan brooks thing ended people are like oh we're gonna be better without dylan brooks it's like maybe we'll figure it out like it's a great experiment like i basically became a dylan brooks apologist where i'm like i've watched every game for years and they're always good when he's on the court even though he's shooting 32 percent. and so it's like i don't know what that means like so maybe they will be actually better without dylan brooks so so like me trying to assess the win total i think when healthy yeah like probably a top five team but they're not going to be healthy. They're missing a job for 25 games. That 46 and a half number feels fair. You know, like they've hit their over also every year. John Morant's been in the league. So I don't know if you, do you ride the hot hand or you do the, uh, the old roulette fallacy. Like it's been black four straight times. I'm going to go red. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I will say, I will say in my, in my, uh, my heart of hearts, I worry this is the year they kind of like run out of the regular season magic where they're like, oh, we really can't depend that much on just these six guys. Um, and we overextended ourselves. But like last year, we also didn't know like Santi Aldama, we had no idea who to be good. And and he and he was a very useful rotation player. And it seems highly likely if it is Zaire Williams or maybe it is Jake LaRavia or if it is David Roddy, somebody might jump back up into that. And then with the high end talent you have, um, 
you're probably going to be all right. So, ah. Uh, I'm going to take the over. I'm going to take a slide over. I'm going to trust. They know what they're doing. I think the Memphis Grizzlies know how to win regular season basketball games. Um, how useful of a skill is that? Uh, it's pre pretty good because I like it because the regular season is long and I watch all the games and I, uh, I value uh, winning. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say f uh, comfortable 47 wins. I'm pretty sure they're 4-0 on the last four over-unders, like clearing the over because I'm 0-4. No, they are. They are. I picked yeah, them yeah. to go under every year, and they've cleared the over. So yeah. the notorious Grizzlies skeptic. Yeah. Yeah. Keith, this was great as always. Thank you for giving us so much of your time. Are you able just to tell our listeners where they can find you and all the fantastic work that you do? Yeah, if you're a Grizzlies fan, you should be listening to Grits and Grinds. I uh, get to pretty... Uh, I give some of this analysis there um, uh, multiple times a week. And then if you're a general NBA fan, please check out Fast Break Breakfast. Cover the whole league. So, yeah, check out Fast Break Breakfast. I think Grizzlies fans do uh, grits and grinds. Link to all those stuff is in our podcast and YouTube descriptions. Grant, do you want to take us out of here really quickly? Yeah, everybody follow Keith. Uh, consume all of his various contents. I'm, well, I just want to say, very disappointed. We were promised a cat uh, incursion, and we did not get. Yeah, the cat. Incursion. I don't. It left. It was nipping my heels early, and then it took off. Maybe the ignore um, tactic it worked. It didn't like Desire Williams' pessimism. No, that, that must have been it. Uh, you follow no. us. You can get a, a at Hardwood Knox. Uh, you can uh, make sure you like, rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your enemies, do all those things. Buy our merch. We got links to the uh, links in the descriptions of our YouTube page. And on all our socials, uh, he's Dan. I'm Grant. This was Keith. Thanks for listening, and we'll uh, check you out next time.